Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne. It's July 20th, 2012. During the midnight screening of The Dark Knight Rises at the Century 16 Movie Theater in Aurora, Colorado, James Egan Holmes set off tear gas and shot into the audience. It was the deadliest shooting in U.S. history. In this multi-part series, we're joined by former Aurora Police Chief Daniel Oates and Denver Division FBI Special Agent in Charge Jim Yacone to talk about heroes, horror, and hope. Welcome to Behind the Crime Scene for part two of our three-part series of the Aurora, Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. I'm Gina Osborne, retired FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge and former Army Counterintelligence Agent. In part one, we discuss the horrific incident and heroic response by the Aurora, Colorado Police Department, FBI, and their law enforcement partners. Today, we'll dive into the psyche behind the shooter, hear about the potentially deadly surprise he left for police at his apartment and his trial. We'll also talk about the impact this incident had on everyone involved. Stick around till the end, and I'll give you some tips to help you survive if you find yourself in an active shooter situation. Now let's go behind the crime scene with former Aurora, Colorado Police Chief Daniel J. Oates and FBI Special Agent Jim Yacone to continue our discussion on the Aurora, Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. Chief Oates, who was James Egan Holmes? Well... First of all, I don't even like to use his name. Uh, one of the things that came out of this event is the notion of no notoriety, that we try not to mention these people by name because that's, you know, that's what they live for is the recognition. But So he was a 20-something Ph.D. neuroscience student in his first year at the University of Colorado. The campus is in Aurora, uh, right there in the center of town part of a huge medical complex that includes the University of Colorado Hospital, Children's Hospital. It's on a former former Army base. He was in the first year of a a full-ride scholarship PhD program. He wasn't doing that well. Sometime around March, he started to seek the treatment of a psychiatrist. He was a troubled person, and uh, I, I know he had some significant number of treatment sessions with a psychiatrist. At the end of the academic year, He had announced that he was leaving the program. He had not yet officially withdrawn from the program, but he announced that he was leaving. We know that from the subsequent detective work that was done, that he had been thinking about this for months. He later, of course, uh, his defense was that he claimed to be not guilty by reason of insanity because the physical evidence against him was overwhelming. And of course, the way this was a capital murder case, he was facing the death penalty you know, the stakes were very high for us. Uh, the most important thing for us was to achieve justice for the victims and the families because we got to know them so well. And we really felt their anguish and their pain. And we had to convict this guy. For for us as law enforcement to have anything uh, resembling some sort of resolution of the event in our minds, we had to get a conviction. And the way you defeat, you know, a claim of, in, of insanity is to disprove it again, in front of a jury, beyond a reasonable doubt. And the way you do that is you have to show that he understood the consequences of his actions and he understood right from wrong. So things like premeditation, which Jim mentioned, and planning were very, very important. The detectives who worked the case in the aftermath, you know, again, with the assistance of our Fed friends, did a superb job of reconstructing his life in the six months to a year beforehand, all the conversations he had, all the electronic conversations he had, And they developed evidence that he had been planning this for some time, that he understood that there would be consequences, and that he was not criminally insane. So, Gina, you know, another interesting fact of this was during the the response phase, Holmes is in custody. And, of course, I uh, immediately reached out to the behavioral analysis units at Quantico and, and the critical incident response group and asked for support. So it was probably the next morning, and I'm on the phone with Andre Simmons, who's one of the unit chiefs in the behavioral science units and or behavioral analysis units. And it was interesting. He said he said to me, and I'm I'm doing a little command staff meeting with the FBI team, and Andre's on the phone with us, and he says, you know, Jim, 
in these types of situations, oftentimes they will write things down. And it was like at that instant, almost eerie that I get a phone call and we're notified by one of the agents um, down at the University of uh, Colorado that James Holmes had actually mailed himself a manifesto. Or actually, Dan, he, he sent it to one of the faculty members at the, at the school. And, uh, and so Dan and I were immediately on the phone with each other saying, whatever you do, let's get court authorization before taking any steps with that. Uh, and let's, let's make sure that we take it into custody. But that manifesto really provided quite a disturbing view into James Holmes and what his thoughts were uh, going into, into the situation, into the incident. And, you know, he had homicidal ideations. He had expressed those to very few people because he was kind of a loner amongst loners, but they were only getting worse. And then really it, it appeared that he just couldn't handle the doctoral program and specifically when he had to do his orals for the doctoral program he was not doing well and he decided to leave the program at that point and then it was just this downward spiral towards violence uh, and unfortunately the help that he was getting from a psychiatrist at the university you know once he was no longer a student that outlet was no longer there for him and he started that downward spiral you talk about premeditation. We know the shooter confessed to officers that his apartment was rigged with explosives. What did it look like when you responded to his apartment? Well, let me start on that, Jim, and with the story of the apartment. By the way, he leaves the door unlocked. He leaves a loud radio playing, okay? And if you step inside the apartment and take like an extra step or two, you hit a trip wire that would have set everything off. His intent was to have the apartment, we've surmised, his intent was to have the apartment go up simultaneously with the attack and perhaps uh, in the theater and perhaps draw police resources to the apartment rather than to the theater. So we do, in fact, around the same time that the shooting starts, we do, in fact, get a noise complaint at his apartment, but no cop responds to the noise complaint because everybody goes to the theater. To this day, I speculate if I had been a patrol cop and there's a really loud radio playing, I might have tried the door after, after knocking and no one answered. And if the door was unlocked, I might have stepped inside. So, you know, I maintain, I actually said in front of the media that that was designed in part to kill us. We know that the apartment wouldn't have gone kaboom. We know that there were no high explosives, as Jim said in the end. But the thing was loaded with combustible materials that would have we would have had a flash fire in an instant and whoever entered inside probably would have been killed and the building eventually would have gone down because the fire folks told us that once that fire started, they would not have been able to put it out uh, very quickly. Jim, what did the apartment look like from your perspective? We did a pretty thorough search before we obviously went into the apartment. In the dumpster, we found hundreds of packages of different chemicals that that he had received at his residence. And we saw the ingredients for what could be high explosives. Thank goodness he was not successful at, at trying to, at creating high explosives. We actually called in some of the FBI's national assets uh, who had uh, significant experience because of the complexity of IEDs that James Holmes had set up in his apartment. And what we were trying to do obviously was First and foremost, kind of preserve the crime scene. We, we had observed through a robot, a bomb technician's robot from, I think, Adams County provided. And uh, we had all observed that there were computers in his apartment. And we knew that they were going to have evidence of premeditation and everything, all the other planning that had gone into this attack. So we were trying to do that. And we were obviously trying to save the apartment complex and be able to successfully deactivate a number of these improvised explosive devices that James Holmes had, uh, had set in his apartments. Weren't there trip wires set up as well? He did set up trip wires and other motion sensor devices and other things inside that apartment. And then he used a professional pyrotechnic firework triggering device to hook everything into. And so Again, the bomb technicians, both local, state, and even the national assets that came in there, all worked pretty closely and very carefully 
at how to disassemble all of the different devices in that apartment and render the whole crime scene safe. And again, it took a few days. It was a successful outcome. Everybody was safe. Uh, we preserved all the evidence inside the apartment, a number of different computers. The integration of the, the local, state, and federal bomb techs was nothing short of amazing. And so I'd, I'd say in terms of heroism, that, that team of experts really did their job. Now, there's another story behind this, and we can get back to the suspect. And Jim knows this story well. He had exercised his right to counsel when he was arrested. So the initial interview by two detectives in the station house after he was transported to, to headquarters, he asked for a lawyer. We had two different lawyers call and say they claimed to represent him. So we knew we couldn't interview him. But Friday afternoon, we had concluded that we absolutely had to interview him about what was in the apartment. And we weren't going to do that with an attorney present under the public safety exception to Miranda. There's a famous Supreme Court case, New York versus Quarles, that set that standard. And if your questions are motivated by a desire to protect people as opposed to to gather evidence, uh, it's, it's a proper exception to uh, the immediate right to counsel. And so I was not involved in this decision, and I'm sure Jim can give you a little bit more insight. And, you know, obviously I would have made the same call as Jim, but again, this all, this is an example of the kinds of things that were going on around me as a police chief that I was even unaware of. But the decision was made by the investigators that this guy has to be interviewed. We have to find out what he knows about what he has set up in his apartment. And we wanted Craig Apple, the lead detective for Aurora, and Garrett Gumbiner, this wonderful explosives expert for the FBI, to jointly interview him. So they did that afternoon. We subsequently won the suppression hearing, and all of his statements were admitted, I think except for one minor statement, one minor admission. Everything else was admitted under that public safety exception to Miranda. So, Jim, uh, I know you were involved in that decision, and I wasn't, so maybe you should tell that story. Jim, I'm sure that was something that you had to reach out to FBI headquarters on. I sure was. <laughs> me, me and uh, me and quite a few folks at FBI headquarters that were going, what? What are you asking for? I quickly engaged counterterrorism because they had used the public safety exception in a number of different terrorism cases in, in the preceding couple of years. And I said, hey, I think this is an instance where we should look for the Quarles exception and look to implement it because we don't know if Holmes has provided us all of the information. You know, he was making utterances during the time of arrest, but we don't know if he had constructed other IEDs and mailed them to hospitals or other locations that we were worried about. And so it seemed to, you know, be the right tool for the right job at that time. And FBI legal counsel and others uh, approved the implementation of it almost right away. Uh, and they saw the need. So uh, that gave Garrett Gumbinner, who was a FBI agent and, a, and a, a really good case agent, but also a fabulous bomb tech, the ability to go in there with Craig Apple, the lead detective, and talk face to face with James Holmes under the Quarles exception. And my understanding is that during that interview, he actually said that had he had more time, he would have left IEDs at the hospitals, the emergency rooms. I can't imagine what that would have been like if that were to have happened. Jim, one of the FBI's famous mottos is trust but verify. How did that play into how investigators conducted the investigation based on what the shooter had told them? Because we had the, the knowledge, right, that Holmes had, had provided us, it, it had slowed things down certainly at the apartment, but it also unfortunately slowed things down very much at the movie theater and with the processing and identification of the victim's uh, and the, and their remains in the theater. We had to be super careful in how we move the bodies and the procedures we use to I fully identify the bodies. Um, and Dan can talk about this, but that that delay really caused quite a bit of frustration and ambiguity for the victims' families that were arriving at the Gateway High School. I think Dan and I are in complete alignment with this. That was certainly the toughest audience I've ever had to stand in front of and talk to them uh, face to face. These were, the, these were the loved ones and paint the picture of folks that had not positively been put in touch with their loved one at a hospital. And so, you know, by default, 
they were fewer and fewer people in this room. And those people that were remaining in the room realized that, okay, I must have a loved one that's in that theater that is a victim. Yeah. The story of that, Gina, is that by noon, we had pretty much located everybody. Anyone who was wounded at a hospital, we had connected the loved ones to that person. Okay. We had two dead at the hospital, uh, a little girl and uh, a young woman, and we had 10 bodies in the theater. And we had 10 families who couldn't locate their loved ones. And they were all represented at the high school because the high school had become the de facto reunification point for anyone who didn't have answers as to where their loved ones were. So if your loved one had evacuated to some more distant hospital and you didn't know that, you didn't know what to do, you went to Gateway High School and we figured it out and we told you because we had investigators at every hospital and we were ma matching families up and, and victim services folks. So it's now four o'clock in the afternoon and Jim and I and the district attorney are at Gateway High School and there's about a hundred people in the library representing 10 families who can't find their loved ones. We had a meeting with them and it, you know, I think Jim will agree, it was pro one of the worst moments of our lives, that, that hour or 90 minutes. You know, I opened the meeting by explaining that because we weren't going to sugarcoat it. We, we felt we had an absolute obligation to tell them the truth. And we told them that, you know, you represent 10 families who can't find your loved ones. And we have 10 bodies in the theater. So almost certainly, you know, I'm very sorry to say your loved ones are, are in the theater and are deceased. But we can't confirm that for several more hours. And the reason is we have to get the forensics right if we're going to convict the guy who did this and get justice for you and your family and your loved one. And because of the explosives issue, we don't know what dangers still lie in that theater. And we're moving very, very slowly to make the identifications. And it was um, extraordinarily painful. I remember one father saying to me, you mean my, my little girl is lying there in the theater and you won't let me get to her? And, and having to say, yes, that's true. And Jim and Carol uh, were, were very supportive you know, in that message with me. And we did the best we could and we had all the victim services folks there, but it was really a really, really rough moment. As, as I maintain, everybody was a victim, including us. Everybody in Aurora, all the first responders, all the agents that responded, we were all in our own way traumatized by this event and carried with us for the rest of our lives. But that was probably, for me anyway, the single worst moment uh, of the whole event. How did this incident impact the city of Aurora? Well, I mean, I could talk for hours about that. It was a cataclysmic event in Aurora. And uh, I was the police chief for another two years after the event before I left in, around the same time in 14. And everywhere I went every day for the next two years, this would be discussed. People would talk in terms of who they knew was in the theater, uh, where they were. It just permeated everything. It was all consuming for government and all the folks in government for several months and the, the aftermath. Things like there was a memorial that was stood up almost immediately. Decisions to be made about when to take that down and what to do with to archive the stuff that had been placed there. There were funerals that went on for two weeks that consumed the community. You know, our event occurs in July, okay? And as a city, we finally feel like we're beginning to climb out of the pain of that event and getting back to something like normal. And it's, it's mid-December or earlier mid-December and Sandy Hook, the Newtown shooting happens, that horrible incident with the, uh, the 20 young kids and a handful of teachers and adults that were murdered at the Sandy Hook school in, in Newtown. And there was just this collective anguish across Aurora. You know, we felt, I don't know, we just, we as a community really felt that, that, that event and the horrible pain uh, and identified with what that community was going through. And it really set us back as a community for a period of time. And there was a real depression, you know, going into that holiday season because of Sandy Hook. Very, very painful. Tragic. Tim Mertz was the agent in charge of the FBI New Haven office at the time. And again, 
she was doing the same thing. She was calling me saying, hey, what do I need to be thinking about here during the response phase of Sandy Hook and, and how best to support the state and locals with that response and the investigation that ensued. But it was the same thing, Dan. I had the same emotions. I, I know the Denver field office experienced the same thing. They were just very concerned. It was a, a bit demoralizing to know that this active shooter phenomenon was not just going to continue, but it was going to speed up. And we were going to start seeing more and more of these things. After everything that happened, how was this case resolved in court? In the end, it took three years, but he was convicted in June of 15. A staggering number of charges, I think, uh, 24 charges of murder, 12 intentional and 12 depraved indifference counts for the 12 uh, deceased. And then something like 124 counts of attempted murder for all the other people, you know, intentional and depraved indifference for the other people that he shot. And then assorted other lesser charges. The jury did not sentence him to death. It was a two-part trial. The first part was conviction. And the second part was the death penalty phase. And the jury hung 11 for death and one for, for life. So that's how it ended. He did not get the death penalty. On average, there are 20 mass shootings each year. My folks and I responded to work on the San Bernardino terrorist attack at the Inland Regional Center in 2015. I can tell you, I have so much respect for the first responders that handle active shooter incidents. One thing I remember is how the community really came together. They were constantly dropping off food for the law enforcement folks, and they supported the survivors and the victim families. Like Chief Oates says, everyone in the community is a victim when something like this takes place. There is an excellent video made by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department called Surviving an Active Shooter. If you'd like to learn more about how to have a better chance at survival during an active shooter incident, this is a great video to watch, and it's online. It's graphic, but it definitely drives the lesson home. I'm a big believer in prevention versus response, so it's important to have situational awareness when you go to the mall, the movie theater, a concert, a sporting event, anywhere where there is a large gathering whenever we're able to do that again. Hopefully, it's going to be sooner than later. If you see someone looking suspicious or like they don't belong, leave the area and report it. Also, in those scenarios, take a minute to figure out where all the exits are. You may not have the luxury of using the exit that's close to you in the event there's a problem. Choosing to sit near the exit is the best plan. If you find yourself in an active shooter scenario, get out, leave your personal belongings behind and run. And once you're outside, keep running. You don't know if there's another shooter waiting outside or if there's an explosives device waiting for you. Run as fast as you can away from the incident and then you can call police and you can call your loved ones. If you find yourself between the shooter and the exit, Use cover and concealment and make yourself as small as possible. Try to find a place to hide. If you can get to a room or some confined area, barricade the door, turn off the lights, and silence your cell phones. And in the last and the worst case scenario, you need to fight. Find a way to stop the threat. On the last part of this series, Chief Oates and Jim Yacone will return and they'll talk about best practices they learned during this event. This is geared toward law enforcement, but I think you might find it interesting. I'll also drop a bonus episode of the Gielan Maxwell Files to update you on what's going on in her world. Please hit that subscribe button and visit me on our website at BehindTheCrimeScene.com to learn more about our show. If there is a case where you want to go behind the crime scene, let me know. This Aurora, Colorado movie theater massacre came in as a request from one of our loyal listeners. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time Behind the Crime Scene. Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne is produced and edited by Lisa Osborne. Theme music is Insomnia by retired IRS special agent Clarissa Balmaceda. Find us on social media through BehindTheCrimeScene.com 
And don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Behind the Crime Scene with Gina Osborne wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Lisa Osborne.